Okay, so we're at uh, the book of Job, subtitled Faithful Living in Times of Crisis. This is lesson number three in this uh, series. And the title of this lesson is The Physical Crisis. And uh, the physical crisis uh, between chapters one, verse one, and chapter three, verse 26. So we've looked at some uh, introductory features of this uh, book. The time period could have been written as late as the time of the Jewish exile in Babylon, 6th to 5th century BC. However, the book describes a, a series of events uh, that took place around the time of the patriarchs. So that's much further back. Uh, talked about the story itself. The story is about a good man who suffers great calamity and loss through no fault of his own. That's you know, basically the, the premise of the, uh, of the story of Job. The characters, again, all this material, I'm not doing a lot, just a little review here. The characters, uh, the main characters, uh, God, of course, and the devil, along with Job, with the, who is the main character, his wife, who plays a minor role, and then there are four, three of his friends and then fourth person who comment on his condition and they give reasons for it. They try to you know, tell him why this has happened to him. Um, the plot, if you're looking at it from that perspective, the plot is mainly compromised of a series of dialogues and monologues that kind of move the story along. So you have the prologue at the beginning telling you who Job was. Then a, a, a dialogue between God and the devil, two sets actually of dialogues there. And then uh, a dialogue between Job and his wife. And then dialogues, three sets of dialogues between Job and his friends. Then the young man Elihu, one, no dialogue, a monologue that he makes. And then God and Job, two more sets of dialogues. And then an epilogue at the end. So uh, there's no, he went here, he did this, they did that, they crossed over here. There's none of that. It's all conversation. It's all dialogue. It's all monologue. And that's what moves the action, if you wish, through the story. These seven sections introduce the character, Job, the setting of his life, the crisis, and how the crisis is handled, interpreted, and then finally resolved. Now we also considered in our previous lessons, a variety of outlines that could be used to guide us in our study. Kind of review of these. We talked about the formal detailed outline. This takes into account every event in chronological order and it, it includes each verse of uh, this uh, book. That's the formal detailed outline. Then you have what's called a compressed outline, where you have the main ideas only. Job's distress, chapters one to three. Job's defense, chapters four to 37. Job's deliverance, chapters 38 to 42. There's a compressed outline. And then you have what's called a thematic outline based upon and develops a theme in the book. And for our study, this is the type of outline that we're using. And the theme that we're using is faithful living in times of crisis, okay? And the way that we've broken this up, there's the physical crisis, and this is explained through the devil's attacks on Job, chapters one to three. Then there's a theological crisis where Job's friends attack Job and his righteousness, chapters four to 37. Then there's a spiritual crisis where God challenges Job in person, chapter 38 to 41, and then Job's faith saves him, chapters 42, one to seven. So each outline covers the same material. However, each outline can emphasize different things about the material. You ever wonder sometimes, why do we always go have an outline when we're studying a book? And if you look at different commentaries, there are all kinds of different outlines. There's no one standard outline. Well, because different outlines, you know, help you to do different things when you're studying the books. For example, a formal outline. A formal outline will focus on knowing the story and its progression and its characters. 
you can explain the story and the characters to somebody else when you know the formal outline. The goal, of course, is familiarity with the book of Job. Why? Because you've gone through every verse, every chapter, every character, the formal outline. The compressed outline, well, the objective here is to interpret the story in a brief form while giving it meaning and context. And so the goal in a compressed outline is to summarize the story in a meaningful and easily remembered way. So, you know, with the compressed outline, remember Job has, you know, he's attacked, uh, he defends himself, uh, there's resolution at the end with God. You know, there, there's a quick summary of, of Job using a compressed outline. And then a thematic outline here, we try to understand what the story teaches concerning a particular religious or theological principle. Okay. And the goal here will be to see what the story means, if anything. So this will be our approach to our study of Job. And I know some of you are thinking, if we ever get to it, and I, we'll get to it. The better prepared you are, the more you can uh, glean from it when you finally get to the passages itself. So following this uh, thematic outline will mean that uh, we'll have to stay focused on Job's attempt at a faithful life, despite the various crises that he faces. And this is, this is difficult because there, are, there is more natural curiosity uh, in getting a better look at the drama of the terrible things done and said to him throughout the book. That's what we're really trying to you know, get into and see. It's like a wreck on the highway. We, we want to see the damage to the cars involved. Whoa, wow, look at those cars, they're smashed up. You know? uh, we we want to find out if anybody's hurt and if they're hurt, what kind of injuries? Did somebody die? You know, we want to know all of that as we're going by, crawling by. But we're less interested in how the drivers feel or think about the accident. Yeah, we don't want to know that. We just want to get going. We want to see what happened, any blood on the ground, you know, and then kind of move on. It's a little bit like that when you're looking at Job. You tend to focus on all the calamities taking place. Oh my, my, what's going on, you know? And less about what does it mean? So in Job's story, there's a lot of tragic events and heated words about why these horrific things have happened to this person, to this seemingly good man. Like the highway wreck, we mustn't be distracted by the damage on the debate, but instead keep our attention on how Job maintains his faith, which is uh, undergoing these uh, various trials. Okay, one thing to keep in mind, uh, however, is that we are observing how Job maintains a measure of faith, not perfect faith. That's very important when you're reading this book. You see, if there's one thing we learn from Job's experience, it's that even the best of us doing our very best only achieve a measure, uh, an incomplete faith, not a perfect faith, if you wish. When we study Job, we're examining this particular man's experience of faith and not necessarily the ideal of how one should express faith, even if Job, uh, Job's belief and tenacity uh, were remarkable as one who lived in the period of the Old Testament with its limited point of revelation. In other words, don't say to yourself, what's wrong with this guy? You know, doesn't he know this? Doesn't he know that? Remember, he hasn't got the gospel. You know, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. He doesn't know what we know. So let's not, you know, as we're studying his character and as we're examining the quality of his faith, let's not compare it to our faith. He was working with different things, okay? All right, so the thematic outline, faithfulness in crisis. And so we look at the physical crisis first, chapter one to chapter two, verse 10. The crisis in Job's life is preceded by a brief introduction of Job himself. In other words, Job, by the way, the term Job or the name Job means he who weeps. <laughs> he who weeps, imagine being named he who weeps. <laughs> uh, certainly fits uh, his experience. So let's take a look at uh, chapter one, shall we? 
And uh, for the sake of our film here, we're gonna read out loud these first couple of uh, verses and read along with me, if you will. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continuously. Now in this short sketch, we learn certain things about Job. First of all, that he was blameless and upright. Uh, meaning he was complete as to his mind and heart. He was straight, he was correct as to his moral conduct. It says he feared God. We would understand this to mean that he had a continual reverence for God, which served as his motivation for justice and truth and efforts at personal goodness. Why do you live this way? Because I fear God, I live in this way. It says he turned away from evil. Very interesting uh, term. We, we don't seem to use that very much today when addressing our conduct. You know, it seems like an Old Testament term. Uh, but what it means is that Job was a man who avoided evil. He had, in other words, no fascination or attraction to or curiosity for evil things, which is the case many times today. Uh, you know, the fact that we have access to so much information, you know, because of the internet and so on and so forth. Have you, have you kind of surfed the internet a little bit and gone on YouTube or stuff like that? Sure, there's music and there are articles, but there are also a lot of dark things there that are not necessarily like, oh, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that stuff, you know. Uh, how, the mind of the serial rapist killer, you know, and a three hour interview with him to find out how and why he did that. Do we really need to spend those three hours to know that? You know, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but I'm, uh, you know, Job, if he had the internet, this is not something that he wouldn't click on that. See what I'm saying? He, he would turn away from those things. He was proactive in avoiding every occasion or even appearance of evil or ungodly people in things. He had no interest in evil for itself. It says he had a large family, seven sons, three daughters. That's a large family in any era. His wife, interestingly, is not mentioned here, which may be a clue to her eventual reaction to his sufferings. She's not part of this at all. Um, we learn that he is a man of uh, great wealth, invested in transportation and shipping of goods. I mean, if you've got 3,000 camels, <laughs> what do you think those are for in that day and time? They're for transport. And surely a guy with a wife and grown kids doesn't need 3,000 camels for his personal use. No, he was a businessman. He was uh, invested in transportation of goods for, for other people, perhaps. Uh, food and clothing production. Again, he had 7,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep just for yourself. No, of course, he was a, a businessman. He uh, was involved in uh, the production of food and clothing. Uh, farming, of course, 500 yoke of oxen. Well, that could, 500 yoke of oxen can till a lot of land. Um, uh, production of milk and personal transportation, 500 donkeys, same thing. So this here is just showing some of the uh, you know, avenues of wealth and uh, resources that uh, Job uh, uh, was involved in. Uh, it says he had a large household of servants who worked his land and his animals and his business ventures, as well as managed and cared for his home and his estate, okay? Now, aside from his personal wealth, 
he was held in high honor by his countrymen and he was considered greatest among them. In addition to all of his wealth, we learn that unlike many rich families where there is jealousy and competition among the siblings, Job's family maintained a close knit and loving attitude among themselves. 10 kids, they all got along. The brothers and sisters managed to get along well. That said something about the way that they were raised and their attitudes, the quality of their character in many ways probably reflected the character of, uh, their, of their father. And then uh, finally, in contrast to his personal wealth and power, we see Job very careful in offering sacrifices to God on behalf of his children, just in case in their youthful, uh, youthful uh, inexperience or ignorance, they may have neglected to do so or uh, neglected to be reverent in their youthful celebration. He wanted to make sure that all the bases were covered uh, as far as the conduct of his children were concerned before God. And so this introduction, among other things, gives us the picture of a man who was the least likely to be the target of the wrath of God, since at that time it was believed that Job's blessings were a visible sign that he was a righteous man. You see, the theological equation uh, of that time simply said the following, good men are blessed and the way of sinners is hard. So if you're good, you get blessings. And if you're bad, you get punishment. And the blessings and the punishment are in real time. They're now, right here on this earth. In other words, good men will prosper and evil men will be cursed in this life here on earth. Every time it was a law, it was a rule, it was a dogma the law of retribution. So this sets the scene of you know, who Job is, how he thinks, what he buys into, and Job buys into this. That's another thing we need to remember. He's, he's part of his generation, a very good man, a rich man, an exceptional man, but he accepts the idea that you know, God blesses when you're good and if you're bad, you're going to be cursed. Uh, you know, he's careful not to do bad things. He's a pious man. He's motivated by his fear of God. What fear? Well, you know, he wants to continue to be blessed. He wants to continue to be in God's good graces. Nothing wrong with that. But we need to understand that when he starts having his discussion with his friends. Okay. So now we have uh, the next scene. You know, this could be a play, very easy. You could stage this as a play pretty easily, you know, on a, on a stage. So the next scene, uh, Satan enters and questions Job's piety. So let's read that, continue reading. It says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for uh, nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased uh, in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. So this short dialogue between God and Satan provides the reason for Job's coming trials. God allows Satan to test the integrity of Job's faith. Sure, sure, sure he believes, of course he believes, but look how you've blessed him. Look how that rule is working in his favor. You know, he does good, you bless him, you bless him some more, he does some more, you know, uh, 
quid pro quo type thing. You know, that's, that's Satan's argument here. And so the Lord uh, allows him to test uh, Job's faith. Uh, Satan, as I said, claims that Job's uh, good character is based on his many blessings. And if some of these are suddenly removed, he'll turn against God. So the key here is that not only are God and Satan aware of the true cause behind the trials rained down on Job, so are we, the readers. We're part of the circle that knows the story behind the story. Job, he doesn't know, the friends don't know, the wife doesn't know, nobody knows this except us, we know it. And of course, God and Satan. Only Job is not in the loop. So keep this in mind, very important. So then in chapter one, verse 13, all the way to chapter two, verse 10, I'm not going to read that, it's too long a passage, but this passage describes Job's sufferings and loss. And so the author gives us a brief summary of the devastation that Satan brings into Job's life. And I'll just list them here so we'll kind of cover that material this way. At first, there's a loss of property and children, chapters 1, 13 to 19. Uh, loss due to people, the Sabaeans, a desert tribe, they steal his oxen. Uh, a loss by nature, lightning, uh, he loses servants and sheep. Uh, a loss due to people, the Chaldeans, uh, take his camels and his servants. And then a loss by nature, uh, a wind comes, a tornado, and kills his family. And so we see following these uh, trials uh, that Job passes this initial test. So let's read the short verses where we hear what Job responds or how Job responds to having been tested in this way. He says, then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head. Of course, this was the traditional way of mourning. Shaves his head and he fell to the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. So this verse, these two verses here, this is Job's finest hour right here. He, he, he's hit the pinnacle right, right out of the box, right here. In that he suffers unimaginable loss all at once, but he does not curse or blame God. He actually praises him. He, he does not feel sorry for himself and use his misfortune for self-pity or anger at others uh, who may be less righteous than he is, but who are not suffering anything because of their sinful lives. You know, he, if there was ever anyone who could have said, why me and not them? Especially understanding the way that he thought about things. You know, so, why me? There are guys way worse than I, and they're just, they're okay. Why has this happened to me? And so uh, he doesn't lose faith. Again, on the contrary, he turns to God for help and comfort by going into mourning. His finest hour, chapter one, 20 to 22. Well, then we, we uh, see uh, Satan's second attack, chapter two. It says, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your power, only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with, a, with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a potsherd to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. So this second test involves a personal attack on Job's body. Up to this time, he still had his health. 
Note that the author reminds the readers that Job has done nothing to deserve these calamities. Verse three says that his suffering is without cause. Now it's important to remember when his friends begin to speak about the reason for his suffering, remember that God has already declared that he's suffering without cause. His illness was a skin disease that covered his body, not necessarily leprosy. In the next few verses, we see the next calamity that takes place, and that is his own wife attacks him. We read just two verses. It says, then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So Job, he loses his children to an accident of weather. They remained who they were, however, his children. You know, he remembers them as faithful and loving and close, even in death. And after the loss of his health, there remains only one last comfort in his life, and that is the love and encouragement and faithfulness of his wife. But in one last cruel blow, he loses these things as well as the effect of the recent losses of wealth and family are demonstrated in her broken spirit as she goads him uh, to do what she herself may have already considered or succumbed uh, to. Imagine, I mean, the person you're depending on, you know, I got one last thing, my partner, my wife. <laughs> and she says, hey, go kill yourself. Curse and deny God. Stop defending him and trying to act justly and faithfully. Escape the suffering by taking your own life. You still have the power to do this. And how, how crafty Satan is in evil. How, in French we say mission, you know, mission. How bad he is. God says, all right, you can strike him you know, with a disease. You, you know, one more curse he has to bear under. You know. And Satan says, all right, thank you. You, know. you didn't say how I was gonna do it. So what does he do? He uses his wife to curse him. Oh my, what a blow. What a sneaky, sinister, evil mind thinks of doing such a thing. And so once again, we see Job rise to the occasion and he does so with patience and wisdom and unshakable faith. And once again, the author confirms that Job remains blameless, even with the loss of his wife's love and support. All right, so now uh, everything has happened to him. You know, the physical crisis has happened to him. In chapters two, verse 11 to 326, we, we see Job's first response to the crisis itself. At this point, the physical and emotional attacks, they cease, and the author sets the scene for the next phase of Job's trials, which are going to be the theological crisis. So he's, he's gone through the physical crisis, the next crisis is going to be theological, how we understand God works, okay? And so we see the arrival of Job's friends, chapter two, verse 11 uh, to uh, uh, 213. It says, now when Job's three friends heard all of this adversity had come upon him, they came each one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Neamathite. And they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and to comfort him. When they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and wept. And each of them tore his robe and they threw dust over their heads towards the sky. Then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights with no speaking a word to him, with no one speaking a word to him. For they saw that his pain was very great. So we have the three friends arrive. We've uh, already uh, introduced these characters in an earlier lesson. Eliphaz, you know, older, wise man, very gracious. Uh, Bildad, uh, educated man, uh, very conservative. And uh, Zophar, the goat, right? Zophar, 
dogmatic and intolerant. Now there's another character, his name is Elihu, a younger man who is a local and he waits until the end to speak so he doesn't appear here. So the three friends arrive to sit and mourn with their friend Job and their period of silence, seven days, is an initial show of respect for Job who despite his losses and illness was in their eyes still a very honorable, a very honorable uh, man. And so we have in chapter three, what's called Job's soliloquy. Job's soliloquy, fancy way for saying his speech. Until this time, Job has only briefly commented on the events that had befallen him. And he responded to his wife's despairing cry to curse God and die. With the arrival of his friends who await some sort of comment from him before they, you know, they don't want to speak before he speaks. And so at some point, Job gives a full monologue that contains his passionate cry for the only event he believes is left for him in his life, and that is for him to die. And so this cry for death is outlined in three questions that he poses. Again, a long passage, I'm not going to read it. I'm just telling you it's broken down into three questions, but it's always the same three questions, the same one. First question, why was I born? Chapter three, verses one to 10. If this is what I've come to, loss of everything for no reason, well then why was I born in the first place? I mean, if my life makes no sense whatsoever, then why, you know, God, why did you, why did you allow me to be born? Second question that he argues, chapter 3, 11 to 19, why did I not die at birth? Okay, maybe, uh, maybe I, I, you know, maybe I'll concede, maybe, okay, I come into this world. I was due to come to this world. Okay, fine. Well, if that was the case, why didn't you just take me right on day one? You know, why, why, why lead me to all of this and then, you know, have it finish in this way? Why was I given life just to suffer for no reason? Why not just take me at birth? That's the second question. And then his third question, chapter three, verse 20 to 26, why can't I just die now then? You know, you've done everything else to me. Why not just kill me? Uh, <laughs> so the present suffering makes no sense. It produces nothing. It satisfies no justice as far as he's concerned. So why not just end it? So Job starts well, but the weight of the physical suffering now joined with the weight of the theological conflict that is beginning to brew inside of him begins to take its toll on his patience and his faith. Theological conflict, if you remember, is that Job and his contemporaries believed that God's justice was meted out in real time. That's a very important point. In other words, degrees of goodness plus righteousness equals degrees of blessings. And degrees of sinfulness equals degrees of punishment. Now, if this is your theology, and this happens to you, <laughs> you've got a problem, okay? If you are basically a righteous man, as Job was. The conflict is the following. Why would God make an innocent man suffer, even make an innocent man suffer greatly? You know, despite the trials of everyday life, whoops, I stubbed my toe, I cut my finger. That's just normal life. But but why should a righteous man suffer these calamities? Certainly that could not have happened to me without God's you know, permission. So in the next section that we're going to cover next week, which will be the theological crisis, Job's friends will begin to explore and even exacerbate this crisis that is going on inside of him. And what we will do is we'll witness their monologue or their debate point and his response. And we'll go through these sets here to see how he handles the theological conflict that they stir up in him. Okay, so that's enough for uh, this uh, first uh, lesson here. Uh, we're gonna finish up uh, this lesson and continue. And for those who are continuing with us, especially uh, you folks who are watching online, 
and of course those who are watching this afterwards on video, I encourage you to read Job chapter four, verse one, all the way to chapter 14, verse 22. It's a bit of an assignment. If you're going to continue with this class, we're not going to do each verse. It'd be good if you're familiar with the uh, material, okay? So chapter four, verse one to 14, 22. 